So in this bite-sized clip, we're going to be looking at the period 58 to 50 BC in Cicero's career, a really interesting period uh, in which you could argue Cicero shows courage, but also is he humiliated. This is the period where Cicero very famously will say to, to Atticus that he has to sing his palino, that is to apologise to, uh, to the first triumvirate in order to prevent being exiled again. So what has happened so far? Well, uh, if you remember, uh, Cicero uh, has been completely against the formation of the first triumvirate. Uh, he was invited to join, but refused to. Caesar, as a result, uh, passed laws to aid in Cicero's exile in 58 BC. So Cicero exiled in Greece for one uh, year. Now, already whilst he was in, uh, in Greece in exile, Cicero had stated uh, that his one hope uh, was for disagreement between the triumvirs whilst he was away in exile. And that's exactly what happens. The triumvirate, remember, were not natural allies. There was an alliance of mutual benefit. Uh, there's only one natural alliance in the triumvirate, and that's between Crassus and Caesar. Uh, Crassus and Pompey had, had long hated each other. With Caesar uh, off in Gaul fighting the Gallic Wars, it left Pompey and Crassus in Rome to return to their, um, their former sort of you know, bitchy relationship between the two of them. Uh, Pompey and Crassus certainly did, uh, did attack each other quite a lot in this particular period. So Pompey, for instance, uh, suffered Claudius's gang attacks. Um, Pompey decided to fight fire with fire and get his own gang leader, uh, Milo. Um, Pompey was blocked by Crassus' uh, allies from restoring Ptolemy in Egypt. Whereas Pompey was also getting you know, increasingly freaked out and, uh, and jealous of Caesar's military successes in Gaul. Uh, and he does nothing to stop the Optimates, granting Caesar a supplicatio, which technically marks the end of the Gallic Wars, uh, which Caesar obviously had not sort of finished at that particular point, therefore making his other actions illegal. Now, one of the big things that Pompey does to sort of really get at Crassus and also to get at Claudius uh, is he's a big supporter of uh, Cicero being recalled. This is a little quote from Plutarch from the uh, life of Pompey. Pompey agreed with those who said he ought to bring back Cicero Cicero, who hated Claudius and was loved by the Senate. Uh, so Pompey, using his, uh, his, his ally Milo, uh, recalled Cicero from exile in 57 BC. So what did Cicero want to do? As soon as he's back in Rome, he sees the triumvirate weak and he sees uh, a, a real chance to destroy the triumvirate and restore the Republic uh, to what he thinks it should be and to, and to obviously promote Concordia Ordinum. And the way that he was doing that was by playing a very active part. Um, one thing he wanted to do was to patch up his relationship with, uh, with Pompey. So he's very influential in, um, in Pompey gaining the Cora Anonai, the supervisor of the grain, which is a great quick way of getting popularity. That would have really annoyed with Crassus. However, Cicero can't quite help being Cicero, uh, and so he makes a speech pro sestio, um, in which he makes some little snipes against the guy called Vitinius, but mainly Caesar, and in pro sestio, he attacks Caesar's legislation as consul, um, and check out this for some feisty stuff to say to Caesar, um, just as he's come back from, uh, from, from, from exile. Uh, if one were to view our republic from the outside, they would see at one side all virtuous citizens in mourning garments struggling for their freedom, and on the other side, those who are polluted and attacked and thrown into confusion and overturned all divine and human laws going about the city merry and joyful. So you've got a real sort of attack um, on, on the triumvirate and, and who they are and where they stand in this republic in terms of destroying this republic. Cicero is given a massive shock when the triumvirs patch up their relationship at two conferences. Um, now, this has some personal um, implications for Cicero. Uh, in particular, Caesar is absolutely furious. He had agreed, or had had to agree, to Pompey recalling Cicero. Um, now, Cicero's brother Quintus, remember, serves with Caesar during the Gallic Wars. Uh, and uh, Cicero, Cicero's brother Quintus had had to give assurances of Cicero good behaviour, um, which he had done, um, uh, this obviously hadn't happened. So really, Caesar absolutely fuming, and Quintus Cicero probably incredibly angry with his brother as well. Caesar very quickly patches up relations uh, between himself, Crassus, and Pompey at two conferences um, at Ravenna and Lucca. These are just inside uh, the Gallic border, um, so Caesar is not 
left his province and committed treason, so he's uh, he's still in Gaul. Um, and over 200 senators are invited for the talks, but not Cicero, so Cicero excluded. What's agreed at this shows the level of power that the triumvirs have over Rome. So what does everyone get out of this? Well, first of all, Crassus and Pompey become consuls in 55 BC. And in addition, they already get their provinces allocated to them. So Crassus, awesomely, will get Syria and go on his Parthian campaign, which will, spoiler, not go very well. Um, Pompey gets Spain, but doesn't really want to go to Spain. Um, so he's going to govern Spain through his legates. Um, he's going to govern Spain in absentia. Cicero would be really not liking that idea. Uh, and Caesar himself gets uh, five more years in Gaul. Um, um, the big thing is that Cicero is going to have to agree to all of these uh, all of these changes if he's to avoid exile again. Um, and very importantly, it shows the level of control that these three have over the Republic. Cicero famously uh, writes in a letter uh, and remarks that he has to sing his palino, that is to almost apologise um, for his actions uh, and has to retreat and he has to make a speech of support in uh, Caesar's command in Gaul and he also has to defend um, allies of the triumvirate. So there's three key examples of the Cicero defending allies of Caesar and Pompey. Um, the first one is, uh, is uh, Balbus, uh, who's a really useful um, ally of the triumvirate. He's Spanish. The optimators are trying to take his citizenship off him. Cicero has to make a speech pro-Balbo, uh, which he uses as a real opportunity to flatter the triumvirate. Uh, the other two are really feisty because they're like sort of personal enemies. So we've got the, uh, the defense of Vitinius. Um, uh, which uh, Caesar had had a bit of a personal run-in uh, in court with Vitinius, plus the Processio speech was kind of, again, you know, the, you know Vitinius featured in that as well. Uh, he successfully defends Vitinius in the same way as he'd successfully defended Balbus's right to Roman citizenship. Um, uh, the other one, though, he has to defend is, uh, is one of Pompey's ally, uh, allies, uh, Gabinius, the guy who'd passed the Lex Gabinia. Now, um, Cicero had some personal beef with Gabinius because Gabinius had been consul when Cicero was exiled and had refused to help him. Um, in a delicious twist of irony, Cicero is un unable to defend Gabinius, and Gabinius is indeed exiled. Now, does Cicero know what he's doing in having to defend allies of the triumvirate and having to backtrack? Of course he does. He remarks in a letter to Atticus that he has to swallow the bitter pill. Uh, and then a little bit further in the uh, in the letter as well, he, uh, he says, since the powerless do not want to be my friends, I must make sure that the powerful are. Now, following this sort of uh, defending um, allies of the, of the triumvirate, in the background, we've got the gang warfare heating up between Claudius and Milo. Uh, remember, Claudius has always been a little bit on the unstable side. Now, because Crassus is dead at Carhai and Caesar's in uh, Gaul, he's kind of let off the leash. And he's candidate for the praetorship uh, in, uh, for 52 BC. Milo one of Pompey's ally, allies was a candidate for the consulship. Now, these two control massive gangs, and on uh, one particular occasion, when one of the gangs is coming from Brundisium to Rome, and the other gang is travelling from Rome to Brundisium, along the Appian Way, at a place called Bovili, a gang fight erupts, uh, and Claudius is killed by Milo. So what actually happens is uh, after Claudius is killed, his funeral pyre destroys the Senate House and Rome erupts into absolute chaos and open gang violence. Uh, Pompey, who's uh, sort of got military experience, is the one that the Senate turned to. They don't want to make him dictator, so for the first time ever they name him uh, name a sole consul, so consul on his own in 52 BC. Uh, Cicero, um, against Pompey's wishes, defends Milo. He uses his pro- Milone speech, but very importantly, the pro Milone speech is a complete disaster. Cicero is intimidated by supporters of Claudius in the gang, also by troops sent in by Pompey. It delivers a terrible speech, and Milo is uh, is is exiled. Now, Pompey, as sole consul, starts making some very sneaky little attacks on Caesar. So, one thing uh, that he'd already done. Uh, is he'd refused uh, Caesar's marriage alliance. Remember, Pompey had been married to Caesar's daughter. She had died in childbirth, uh, and he'd rejected the chance to renew that marriage alliance. Instead, we're marrying one of the daughters of the Optimates. He made a law against bribery at elections, um, something that Cicero, sorry, that Caesar had been uh, 
um, had been guilty of. And then finally, he passes a law called the Lex Provincia. Uh, now, the Lex Provincia, on the surface, is a really, really good thing, but actually underneath it is a really sneaky way of attacking Caesar. So what the Lex Provincia was about was about sort of stopping electoral bribery and extortion in the provinces. What many politicians would do is they'd raise loans for bribery elections, they'd therefore become elected as consul or a praetor, then they'd become a governor of a province, and as a governor of a province they'd use systematic extortion to make as much money as possible to then repay the debts that they'd, they'd sort of raised initially in order to become elected as a consul or praetor. What the Lex Provincia does is it snaps the link between the election as a consul or praetor and then becoming a governor of a province. You then have to wait five years uh, before that. So obviously no loan shark's going to wait five years to get their money. So there are some really, really good things about Pompey's Lex Provincia. On the one hand, it sort of stops sort of extortion and it stops uh, or tries to prevent electoral bribery. The short-term impact is there's a lack of governors for five years. Um, this is going to have an impact on Cicero. The sneaky thing is, is that it's all about sort of stopping Caesar, stepping from a governorship to a consulship to a governorship again, uh, which would, uh, if Caesar had got his way, would keep his imperium and make him immune to being um, prosecuted in the courts. The impact for Cicero, Cicero's kind of collateral here, is that he's sent to Cilicia in 51 uh, BC, and he's far from happy about it. He's going to do his best, he's going to do a great job, uh, but he's not particularly happy at being sent all the way to Cilicia uh, when this civil war between Caesar and Pompey is starting to brew up. So in summary, in this sort of whole palinode section, this eight-year period, we've got Cicero being recalled from exile, uh, being influential in, in gaining Pompey the Cora Anani, but then angering Caesar and making the pro Sestio speech. Remember, he's not invited to the conferences at Ravenna and Luca, and as a result has to sing his palinode, that is to defend enemies sorry, uh, his personal enemies were allies of the triumvirate Balbus, Vitinius and Gabinius. His pro Milone speech is a complete failure and Milo is exiled. Um, Pompey's sole consulship, remember, Cicero is completely against the idea of a sole consul. He's likewise uh, against Pompey's uh, in absentia governorship of Spain as well. Um, uh, and the Lex Provincia sends Cicero to Cilicia in 51 to 50 BC, where he will have some successes, but when he comes back to Rome, he's going to come to a Rome that he's going to describe as a madhouse, and we're going to have the civil war kicking off between Caesar and Pompey.